I'm Katrina, and this is So and Tear. And today I want to talk to you guys about soil. I'm not really going to be digging around the soil very much right now. Kind of just an informative talk about soil. So there's a lot of things that happen in the ground underneath us, in the ground underneath our gardens and all of that. Um, something to consider is there are three types um, of things that make up the dirt part of the soil. So soil has life, dirt is the, the dirt part. Um, there is loam, and so there's sand, loam, and clay. Sand is the big stuff you see at the beach, and there's a whole variety of sizes of that and all of that. That is the largest one. Loam is somewhat in between the middle of, of sand and clay, and loam tends to hold a lot more of nutrients and a lot more of the um, the uh, organic material, all of that. And then clay is the smallest particle uh, of the three. And you can have a clay loam, you can have a sandy loam, you can have, you know, it's not just one, two, three, it is a whole variety with a range within um, those. So uh, things like peas and stuff like that really like a, the, a sandy soil that drain really well and all of that. So so soils that, let's scroll over there, soils that drain really well often have a lot of sand in them and it could be like perlite and stuff has been added to it as well. But um, as far as native ground, that's usually what it is. And then if soils retain a lot of moisture, it tends to be a high clay content. Now, you can grow in any soil that you have. Um, you might have to add things to it. You might have to add drainage, um, add things to make it drain better. You may have to add things to, re to retain more moisture. So knowing your, what your soil is, is a very interesting thing uh, to learn and so you can start by just looking at it and saying okay does this have big grains or small grains and and um, there's a whole test I'm not gonna go through right now there's a whole test is called a, a ribbon test that you actually make a ball and you make a ribbon you know like a little little uh, play-doh snake uh, to see what that is that's an easy thing you can do out in your in your garden or in your field um, to test that there's also regular soil tests and all that however I want to give you some tips um, sandy soil because it is so um, because it drains so well has a lot of um, issues with needing to be watered more often. So that's something that happens with sandy soils um, that are really, really sandy because things drain right through. Um, when you have that happening, if you add organic material to that, then that will be able to hold more moisture. So some ways you can do that is to just to add compost. And if you add it on top, that's the best way overall to do things but if you're starting a new garden area it's totally okay to till some things in um, what i do is i don't till things except for in new spaces so my whole front yard when i when i bought the house the whole front yard was um topiary shrubs with four inches of lava rock with plastic underneath like that was that was dirt, that was not soil, did not have life. And so then when I was when I was able to, you know, take all that stuff off, the ground was just so compacted, it did not have life in it, it was it was dead. And so in that case I actually borrowed my neighbor's rototiller and rototilled the heck out of that thing. And I did not mix things into it at that point, but I got it loosened up so the moisture could go down, you know, when it rained. And I actually added, uh, where I planted things, I kind of dug a hole, put uh, compost and stuff in there, and only in those areas where I planted, but then I didn't plant very much. Um, and then what I did is that when I put in wood chips, that's when things really changed. Um, so I'm gonna back up, because I actually have clay soils. For clay soils, uh, what you do for clay soils Clay soils are wonderful and they're also horrible. So they are horrible because they actually, they hold a lot of water. So if you have a humongous storm and you have tons of stuff go through, you can actually rot out your 
roots of your plants. So I had that happen with a couple plants that I had here. Um, there's a Fremontonia tree that the roots rotted. Um, that just happens, it happens sometimes. Um, but they're also wonderful because they hold on to water. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, they do hold on to water more than the other, um, more than more than sand for sure. And part of that's good, part of it's not good. And depends what you have growing there. It depends if there is drainage in addition to, you know, like if there's a slope or if the water sits. Um, there's a whole slew of things that can depend on, but it does hold some water, which is, it can be good. If it holds too much water, it's not very good. Um, and so what's the answer to that is you add organic matter. All right, pause. I forgot one really important thing about clay soils. So here we go. One really important good thing, positive thing about clay soils is they are negatively charged. Most of the nutrients you put into your garden are positively charged. Negative and positive, they come together. So clay soils hold on to a lot of nutrients and that is really, really good for your garden. All right, we're going to unpause back to the regular scheduled content. So you can see a pattern here. The answer to your soil is add organic matter. And when you add organic matter, that can be in the form of compost. It can be in the form of things that are not composted yet and you're going to use that space later. Um, you can compost your animal's waste. You can rabbit manure you can use directly in your garden um, and all of that. So there's there's things you can do for your soil to make it better. And the answer is always compost. Now, that being said, you do wanna make sure that you are growing in an area that did not have a lot of pesticides, a lot of herbicides, stuff like that. Um, if you live in an, an area that like used to be an old orchard, a lot of places just dump things. Um, a lot of practices were to go on the roads and put used motor oil on the roads to avoid dust. It made sense in the time that they were doing it. It does not make sense now. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> but that is something to understand. If you're if you're actually if your property if your land has a history of that, you may want to look at things differently. You may want to try and remediate that. And there's a whole bunch of different bioremediation things that you can use depending on what what. Uh, you have going on, you can remove it. People do that, you, you can scrape out the whole thing and remove it and that has to go to a permitted appropriate landfill um, to have kind of contaminated soil and that can be very expensive. Um, you can cover it up, you can flat out, just cover it up, do raised beds. Um, you know, that kind of solves your issue for a little bit, um, well, for a lot of it. Uh, you can also do bioremediation and I haven't actually done bioremediation. I just know some of it. So I know that um, things like mushrooms can be used for bioremediation. Different kinds of mushrooms pull different things out of the soils. And then um, things like sunflower. Sunflowers are used for heavy metal um, bioremediation. So bioremediation is remediation with life. So in this case with plants or fungus. So fungus are not plants. <laughs> Man, I gotta use another pause here. Well, bacteria and algae are also really good bioremediators for if as long as you have the right kind. All right, unpause. And so that can be something that you might have to address. Other than that, if you are having issues with your soil and they're not contaminated, um, try using compost. You put compost in there and it will do things. Um, it'll do really good things. I add compost to my beds every year when I when I plant or before I plant and people do this one of two ways. They either do it in the fall because that is when you see you know mother nature is dropping all these leaves. You can't see that but that's okay. Um, there's all these leaves on the ground mother nature is dropping all these leaves and that's when the earth says hey everything up here come down on the ground, decay, and and provide for next year. That's what's happening. So the duff that you see in the in the forest, that all that you most the majority of it falls 
during fall. That's why it's called fall. Uh, it's autumn, but they call it fall because things fall. <laughs> so that's something to think about with that is mother nature fertilizes in fall. And you can think of it that way. And a lot of people do it that way. Now that works. There's something you need to consider um, as well. Uh, if you live in a really, really, really rainy area and it's really, really rainy in your fall and your winter, you can actually leach out the nutrition from, from what you put on. And, uh, you know, you may add more in the spring or a, or a little bit in the spring. Um, and so some people do it in the spring because they're afraid of that things are going to be leaching out. Uh, the nutrients are going to be leaching out in the fall and in the in the winter. Now I'm going to be adding to my bed in the next couple of weeks. So this is like, you know, beginning of the year, but it's winter. But we haven't really, we had some rain. We haven't really had a whole lot of rain. We haven't really had, uh, we don't freeze here. We don't get, well, we do freeze here, just very not often. Um, the leaves aren't even all, all the way off all the trees yet. The peach is hanging on. Um, the plums are hanging on the front. You know, most things the leaves are off if they're deciduous, but um, yeah, so there, so things are self composting here and I support that. I don't rake up the leaves. I don't, you know, do all that. Where the leaves fall, they fall unless they're in my gutter. <laughs> they don't stay there because um, they will compost. You want to do a test, <laughs> leave the leaves in your gutter. You'll come out with soil. <laughs> don't do it. Um, just trust that that's, that's what happens. Uh, so that's something that you can think about is um, over time, things break down and become soil. So I have a wood chip pathway. You guys have seen it before. I'll link a video up here talking about um, uh, composting wood chip pathway. I have a comp I have a whole composting um, playlist I'll put up here. Actually, I might include this in the playlist. We'll see. And so when you when you have a wood chip pathway, there's a whole bunch of things that you that happen. Um, I was using it. I was using it one because I watched a YouTube channel that used a lot of wood chips, and I was like, wow, that's working for them. I'm gonna see if it works for me. And two. I put it as a pathway because I was getting so much mud. I mean, I ha like I said, I have clay soils. Clay soils plus water means water sits. Um, now I have since dug a couple trenches that have some drainage and I will do a video on that eventually. <laughs> Hopefully I took pictures. <laughs> um, but that actually worked really, really well. It got my feet out of the mud. It got me able to, to do things outside. And so I put down, you know, that much I don't know, 18 inches at a time and that is great and you can you can build up on that as much as you want now what's going on in that layer currently so I used to just have wood chips and by wood chips I mean tree chips right so you have the leaves in there you have the needles in there you have all of those things that come from a tree because I get them free from a tree service tree trimming service so they have to pay to dump their their uh, wood chips they can dump it here for free and I can wheel our things back. Um, now what's happening underneath my pathway that I walk on every day is it's an active compost pile. Um, now how diverse is it depends on what you do with it. I was just using the um, compost. I was just using the wood chips for a long time and I have since added uh, manures to that. And that's good because the flies don't get to the manure when it's buried. I actually just pull up some, put it down, bury it again. And the insects and other living critters in the pathway will be able to process that and get to it, but the flies don't, and that's important. So that's what I do with my grow out rabbit manure and my, and my quail manure is I actually bury it in the pathways and you'd be surprised at how fast it goes away. In fact, I'll put a video here um, of me looking for it. <laughs> and and you'll see how fast it goes away and by going away it doesn't really disappear um, all the the worms and the insects and the bacterias and all this they all get in there and and have a feast and they leave their frass or their castings um, and you actually end up with 
some really, really good nutrition mixed in. Now you do have to kind of wait then for the wood chips to break down um, to add that. But what you can then do is rake off the top layer and you can collect this really, really dark, good compost. And the compost, you can just literally take that straight and put it onto your beds. Um, so I use that compost and I also use the compost from my Racken House and from my main aviary and raviary. Now these are um, wood chips and, am and animal manures that are mixed in as they are as they are being made and broken down and stuff and so those ones because i had, do have chickens and quail which are hot manure uh, rabbits are cold manure um the the birds have the hot manure so i actually bag those up into feed bags and put them in my garage for a while as uh, six months you know some of them i have in there for a year and i'll actually pull those out and put them on the beds um pretty much now so that's what i'll be doing in the next next couple weeks is taking those bags from the garage and doing that because I get to I get to take more out soon <laughs> um, and so that process of making your own compost can be as simple or as complicated as you want it could be as simple as laying down a bark to pathway scooting it out you know once or twice a year scraping off the top collecting what's there and put it on your beds it could be that simple it could be as simple as doing the same thing and putting it in with the chickens and the chickens will will churn up everybody's everybody's stuff um, it could be as complicated as the quail you know I have to be the chicken I do have to turn that for them and that's really as complicated as I get here. You can go crazy with compost you can go so crazy with compost and there are people that know a whole lot more about composting than I do. I choose to use my animals to compost because I figure they're doing it anyway. They're turning things, I mean, with the chickens, they're turning things up anyway. If I want to add something to a compost and it's not something that's harmful to them, I will just put it in with them. Um, when it's time for the tomatoes, okay, right there. When it's time for the tomatoes to go into somewhere, which is soon, <laughs> maybe this weekend if I get to it, so I can replant that area, I actually lay those, so I, you don't want to give um, the tomato family, you don't want to give the leaves of that to your animals because it's poisonous. So I don't do that. Everything else goes in with the chickens or, or the quail. But for those, what I do is I put them underneath my fruit trees and then I add a layer of wood chips on top of them. And then that just simply decays as it's, as it's supposed to. And you speed up that process by adding um, the wood chips to that. And life will find it. So that's the exciting thing. When you have... So we talked about the three different kinds of soil. We talked about adding... Um, compost to that soil what happens when you add compost to a system is amazing so the compost when you add it it doesn't do much for a little bit some plants it'll do it'll like rain and it'll you know, rain that compost in it'll be really really good and then your plants will be turning green right um, greener than they were <laughs> Uh, but what happens long term is you actually get microbes, you get, you know, good bacterias, you get you know, roly polies and earthworms and uh, all these little critters that become a community. You're building community. You're building your soil, you're building community. And the more you do this and the more you add to that system, whether it's just leaving the grounds underneath your leaving the leaves underneath the trees on the ground and not raking them up or you know leaving things in place or taking these tomatoes and putting them underneath something that actually increases the biodiversity of your of your area of your soil and when you have a biodiverse soil it's amazing what happens because you have all these critters in there they're all feeding on things and you know excreting their waste and their waste is good for the plants and the plants find the waste and there's little pockets of food for the plants to find um, they have tunnels in the soil and 
um, you know, tunnels might be this big, but they have tunnels in the soil that the roots can follow and pick up these little packets of nutrition. Um, you also have mushrooms. We have tons of mushrooms right now popping up. Um, it's rained last couple days, I guess it's rained. I just got home yesterday from being on a trip, but we have tons of mushrooms popping up and those mushrooms are an amazing network of just this fungus that is really, really good. A lot of fungi actually have relationships with trees, with plants, with your, you know, carrots. <laughs> um, they have relationships with your plants and they get the sugars from the, from the uh, trees and that the trees make from the sun. They get sugar from the sun um, through, through photosynthesis. And then the microbes will actually go out and find nutrients that the, tr the plants are lacking and bring them back for the plant. I mean, it's a ridiculous highway underneath our feet. So when you support growth of a biodiverse soil and a biodiverse, um, not just soil, but yard. So if you have a yard, a garden, a farm, if your area is more biodiverse, you're gonna have better things happening. And I mean, yes, earwigs do eat sometimes things you don't want them to eat, but they also do good things. So, you know, there's a balance. You, and if you have too many earwigs, you might not have enough of something else. So you wanna keep your system in balance. And by doing that, it's, it, you're gonna see such a big difference. And what I've seen is if you start a new bed, the first year it's gonna be maybe a little rough. You know, you're gonna have some good nutrition on the top with the comp, you know, add compost, you're gonna have some of that, but then it's gonna run out and you'll be like, oh, what's going on? All right, I guess I'll fertilize or I'll add more compost or whatever. Um, second year is gonna look a lot better, but it's still gonna be like, you might have to baby it. By the third year, years three through five, that's where I found that the soil really explodes with life. And I've started a lot of new beds here. I've started a lot of new things and it's been consistent that within three to five years, that is when your garden beds are just, they've figured it out. That you have the microbes in place, you have everything going on and you're you've built a system by that time so be patient the first couple years when you are doing your soil amendments and doing all of these things because it might take a couple years for things to kick in um now the good news for that is i know in the past i've done i'll put a link here um i've done a video about rock dust and when i was at the national heirloom expo this past e uh september um, I spoke with, uh, there was a lady there from Azamite and I, I said, let's get together and do a video and I haven't done that yet. So hopefully she's still interested. She was interested at the time. And they found through research is that they have the nutrition going into plants way before where they previously thought. So it was previously thought that you put that stuff on now and next season is when you're going to see the results they're seeing results within that within the same season so that's pretty awesome um those that don't know you know again watch that video on the rock dust but that basically brings in micronutrients to your soils because if the micronutrients are not in your soils to begin with how's your plants going to get them right how are all these, you know, you, you hear about each individual vegetable or fruit is high in something, right? Well, how is it high in that unless either plant makes it itself or um, with a, you know, com with the combination of sunlight with their photosynthesis or it actually is in the soil. So um, having that rock dust, my opinion, is a really good thing to do and um, apparently doesn't take as long as we previously thought, which is cool. Anyway, I've kind of gone all over the place. <laughs> I hope um, this video has been helpful uh, to know whatever soil you're growing in, um, one, you can deal with it. You can either, either if, it's, if it's soil that's contaminated, 
don't buy that area. If, you, if you're looking to buy, don't buy that area. Um, but if you've already have a place and it's by, it's, it is, um, it has bad stuff on it, you can scoop it out and, and, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of permitting that goes with that. So I'm not, I'm not going to even go into that, but, but it can be done. You can remove it and to a, an appropriate facility, um, with permits and fees and all that. You can cover it over and just grow and raise beds and that's perfectly fine. Um, or you can buy, you can buy re remediate with, with plants and fungus, but if you have too sandy, too clay, too much clay, um, you can fix basically everything by adding compost. Um, you're going to want to look at drainage as well, and we can talk about that another time, but you want to make sure that you, your soils are draining. If your soils are not draining, then everything's just going to be flooded, and that's not good either. So as long as your soils can drain, <laughs> adding compost is a great fix. So, um, yeah. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully it was informative. And if you have questions, we do have a live chat every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And we can have more interaction there or put your comment down below and we'll chat down there as well. And people can share their experiences, <clears throat> share what your experiences are with composting um, and with using other people's compost, with making your own compost, with adding adding stuff to your beds to make it better, adding stuff to your ground to make it better, uh, how to make your growing spaces better. That's what, that's what we all aim to do, right? So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and let's get out there and garden. Thank you. Get a, give a like if you liked it. Sh please share it around with your gardening friends. And hey, if you're not subscribed yet, consider subscribing. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching and enjoy your day.